Hi, my name is Paul Edwards. I'm a photography major at Kellogg Community College in Battle Creek, Michigan. The reason for this uh, documentary is uh, to experience some of the hardships and trials that earlier photographers uh, went through to produce a silver gelatin dry plate. How I got interested in the dry plate process was taking a workshop in a class that involved wet collodion plates, which the picture was shot and, and had to be processed right then. From the time the collodion was poured to processed to finished uh, photograph was a matter of, a, of minutes. And uh, I wanted to experience what it took to create a plate that was shootable and able to process at a later date. The silver gelatin dry plate process, the chemistry involves photographic gelatin, potassium bromine, potassium iodine. These all can be mixed at the, the proper proportions in ambient light. Under a red safe light you add the silver nitrate which is a light sensitive material. Um, one, once that's mixed and poured into a tray to cool and turned back to gelatin the, uh, there's a process where the, uh, the gelatin is run through a potato ricer, noodles are made, the noodles collected in a piece of cheesecloth are rinsed in ice water and uh, then remelded back to a, to a liquid <coughs> and 95% uh, grain alcohol, thiamol, and chrome alum. The chrome alum is a hardener which makes the gelatin a little more durable and also an adhesive which allows it to stick to the glass. The reason why glass was used is they really had no polymer, clear polymer papers or anything like that to use so glass plates were used And really when we're talking about photography, um, early photography, we're talking about early experiments. Um, there, you know, in early experiments were a, a synthesis of three, at that time, emerging technologies. You've got mechanics, you've got optics, and you've got chemistry. Um, early mechanics, of course, we'd have to talk about the camera obscura. Um, and of course, the early camera obscura was used, was a, was a room-sized um, camera. Um, that was used to observe solar eclipses, um, celestial events that involve the sun. Um, th these first camera obscuras were room-sized, uh, as I said, and they had a, what, what's coined as a pinhole, um, a very small aperture or pinhole drilled into one wall. And the smaller the hole, the uh, fewer rays of light that could pass through it, and the more easily the image could focus on the back side of the camera obscura, the, the opposite wall. And the image that was formed would have been upside down and laterally reversed. Um, but it would have been effectively your first movie, your first cinema. Um, it, you know, it wasn't really until the Renaissance in the 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th centuries that we really see the, the camera obscura used as a tool by artists to, um, to paint. Um, the camera obscura at that point um, was smaller, portable, um, it had optics in it, and um, artists could, could trace from reality. They, you know, the, the optics would gather more light and project it onto a piece of paper and they would trace from reality. Now, optics, of course, we've already mentioned, and optics came about um, naturally, just like with camera obscura. Optics are going to gather more light and project it uh, more easily. 
The drawback, of course, of optics is they have a focal point. When you add a lens to something, the distance from the lens to where the film or the, the room in this case would have to be a very precise, have to be focused. But um, the, you know, the drawbacks um, are far outweighed by the benefits. Um, really, we don't see compound um, lenses until 1600s, 1700s. And um, you know, Galileo in 1600, um, using lenses in a telescope to discover Jupiter. 1800s, um, optics uh, have progressed even more. Uh, we have what's called the Camera Lucida, is invented uh, around 1807. The Camera Lucida is a modified camera obscure. It's a portable. Um, it's really not, it, it takes the, the parts of a camera obscura and uses magnifying glasses to be able to trace from reality. Um, you effectively have an optics. You're looking through and another optics that you look over and you're able to, to trace from reality more precisely and right up, up to that at this point. We talk about the other side of this um, early experiments for photography. We have to talk about chemistry. And um, the, the principles of the camera were known in antiquity, but the chemistry wasn't. wasn't. It wasn't really until the 1700s that we have uh, German scientists um, observing that silver will darken under white light. And that really sets the stage for light sensitive uh, materials for film, for early plates. Um, um, it wasn't really until 1800s um, that uh, we have the invention of the discovery, really, of, of hypo, of sodium thiosulfate, uh, which, of course, is what we used even today to stop the action of light on silver to fix an image. Um, and, of course, that was um, discovered by uh, Herschel, one of, the, one of the forefathers of modern photography. Um, and it's, it's Herschel that actually um, coined the word photography. Um, it wasn't until 1839 that we started using the word photography to describe what we know as photography today. Um, photos meaning light and graphene meaning to draw. And it wasn't really until 1826 when um, Joseph Niefor Niepce made the first photograph. Niefor Niepce who was a French guy who was essentially trying to create not photography as we know it, but he was trying to invent a method of printing engraved images for mass production. I mean, basically the history of photography starts out with a quest for trying to distribute uh, image-based information. But it wasn't until a few years later when he connects with Louis Daguerre, and they work together on a process, you know, trying to further this process. Niepce dies, and then Daguerre takes over, and by about the late 1830s, you have what's called the Daguerreotype. So this was a you know, wildly popular process. Um, the Daguerreotype itself used a, a copper plate coated with silver that was highly, highly polished, um, like a mirror which is exposed to various chemical fumes, then put in a camera and exposed, and then developed in fumes of mercury. Which, as you can imagine, wreaked havoc on the first generation of, of photographers. Um, um, neurological disorders and nervous system disorders as a result of it. At that point, they didn't realize that mercury was hazardous or toxic. Uh, one of the downfalls of that uh, of the daguerreotype is the fact that you only have one single image, really. And if you wanted that copy, uh, copied, if you wanted that image copied, you nailed it to a wall, put your daguerreotype camera in front of it, and shot another copy. At the same time the daguerreotype was being developed and invented, over in England, William Henry Fox Talbot was working on a process called the calotype. Now the calotype is a process that creates a paper negative and then is turned into a paper positive image. So that's where we get the first bit of positive negative technology. Um, it was a two-step negative positive procedure um, and it was you know it was not the first photo process because it wasn't introduced to the Academy and it certainly wasn't uh, going to be as successful as 
the daguerreotype process because it was soft and painterly. After producing my uh, silver gelatin emulsion, um, I, I cleaned the glass plates, poured the glass plates, dried them, and then packaged them. And uh, as long as I went that far to create my own dry silver gelatin plates, I wanted to experience what earlier photographers did. Uh, rain or shine, warm or cold, there was no fair weather shooting. Um, so <clears throat> I packed up the 8x10 view camera with a box of 9x7 glass plates and uh, trucked off to find interesting and suitable things to shoot with these glass plates. The uh, where the uh, collodion plates in early photography were in, in evolved, they could see what they got right then. Um, the silver gelatin dry plates, um, I processed at a later date. There's no guarantee whether there was an image or not an image. You know, the uh, in in making the emulsion. Nothing over 120 degrees is allowed. I kept all my emulsions. I tried to keep that all the temperatures down around 103, and uh, I found that the um, the plates poured the best. <coughs> the uh, the trek into finding the right spot through you know through areas and carrying the equipment. Um, hoping you don't break the glass plates. And uh, <clears throat> the exposures, um, the ISO of the plates, uh, the plates I happen to pour, I'm not sure what the ISO was, maybe a quarter, could be one, but I doubt it. But none, none were done under 15 minutes at an f-stop of 32. And really, moving forward from there, um, as I said, daguerreotype reigned supreme until the 1850s, and it wasn't really until 1851 that we get our next most successful plate process, um, the, the colloidian wet plate or wet plate colloidian process. What the wet plate negative does is it gives you the sharpness and clarity that people liked about the daguerreotype and the reproducibility that you were able to get with a calotype negative. And so once the wet plate collodion method comes in, it is like the reigning method, technical method for photography for the next 25, pretty much arguably to for the next 30 years. It is how photography is done. So if we talk about uh, wet plate collodion, uh, we're talking about the, the, the chemical itself, the, the emulsion that it creates. Um, Collodion was a mixture of gun, cotton, ether, and alcohol. So it's very toxic and um, very um, fume-ridden. Um, early practitioners had to use it very carefully. Uh, and, and it, depending on the substrate um, and how it was exposed, really spawned two other processes um, around that in the 1850s. The tintype, uh, of course, and the uh, ambrotype are the two, two big ones we would talk about. The tintype came first, um, and the tintype was wildly affordable and wildly popular as a result. Now the tintype really became a very, very popular form of photography, which lasted from the mid-1850s all the way up, essentially dies out by the 1920s, although there's always somebody around somewhere shooting tintypes, and has had a great resurgence in the past couple of decades, really. Um, the, it was much quicker because um, it didn't need bubbling mercury, for example. Um, the exposures were quicker. You coated a piece of, of metal, a uh, sheet of metal, exposed it while it's wet, uh, processed it on the site, and within just a couple of minutes, 
um, it was ready for your customer to walk away with. And it was a thin plate that was coated in one side with what's called Japan black. A wet plate image on a tin type, again, is essentially a negative, a very thin negative, but because it's on a black plate, reads as a positive. Um, and so as you can imagine, um, it was well received. It was affordable so all the masses could, could afford to, to have their picture taken, um, not just middle or upper class like the daguerreotype proce process. Uh, the dilemma with the tin type was it was one of a kind. And so the solution at that point was to make cameras that had multiple lenses and would make multiple shots at once. You could just go to the tin type parlor and you'd be out of there in 15 to 20 minutes with several portraits. Uh, often they were shot four at a time with a multi-barreled camera. Um, the solution for the, the multiples issue um, of being able to print a tin type would have been an ambrotype. An ambrotype is a, um, a sheet of glass coated with colloidium and underexposed in the camera to make an, a negative. Um, and when that negative is, is backed with a sheet of black, it becomes a positive. And so the ambrotype, uh, because it was glass, could be printed and multiples could be produced. Um, this also like spawns this huge industry of smaller, lightweight, faster cameras with smaller, lightweight, faster lenses. Uh, in 1888, Kodak also finally perfects roll film and introduces the Kodak camera, which of course we all know the saying, you push the button, we do the rest, which further disconnects the operator from the technical responsibilities of photography. Now, you all know with uh, digital photography, <laughs> if something goes wrong with your printer or if something goes wrong with your computer, you're essentially you are devoid of any, you know, do-it-yourself uh, answers to those problems. And I think that's one of the reasons I really love old processes, tintypes and whatnot, is because there is sort of like this spirit of do-it-yourself, you know, uh, uh, control over the situation that is kind of lacking in digital photography. Commercially, you don't really have photographers today using historical practices, um, not wildly at least. Uh, you have a niche market there. You have some people who do plates, who shoot daguerreotypes, who shoot wet plates, do tin types, uh, and they sell it commercially, and there's still a market for that. Certainly not to the degree that, that you do with a digital camera. I don't know. There's a certain mystery to a lot of these processes, I think. I mean, you watch, oh, you, you're watching, you, when you pour a chemical across a metal plate and see an image come up, there's something that's like really, that's just cool. There's no other word to describe it, okay? And I do not get the same sensation when I'm sitting in front of a digital printer. But it's so much nicer to be able to have a mentor or to be able to go to school to learn that kind of process. And it's just not taught today. And there's no formal education for historical practices. Sure, there's a class here or there in a school. We, for example, here at KCC teach um, alternative practices. We've taught tintype before, and some of these early plate processes, but we don't have a class set aside just for that type of, of process. And it's allowed us, in a way, I think, to kind of like circle back back again to the beginnings of photography where it's more where it's more do it yourself it's a more do it yourself attitude really it gives you the satisfaction of control um, the thing though that is absolutely great about digital you know I mean obviously in this day and age you can't reject it I mean think about it taking a picture on your phone and then sending it over the the airwaves I mean that's really pretty amazing and I've often stopped and wondered that if the fellows that were creating photography at the beginning had access to digital right from the get-go, what way would they have actually gone? It's kind of an interesting question to ponder. But obviously, you know, there's still interest in plate-based. Um, there's a mystery to it. You know, early film photography, early plate-based photography, 
there was just this mystery of what you're going to get when you develop the image. What was in front of that lens during that long exposure? What, you know, what kind of unknown has, has occurred? The, the mystery of, of, of the darkroom itself, there's an ambiance there and a, quite uh, an experience to, to be in a darkroom. So that, I think, is, is quite alluring for uh, modern photographers who are used to digital. Digital is ubiquitous today, and everyone knows how to do it. Everyone has a digital camera, whether it's on their phone or in their, their bag. But plate-based photography is, is still quite uh, unique and quite uh, rare. So that's quite alluring for many folks. Out of my 40-some poured plates and five different mixtures of emulsion, this is the results of my, my efforts. Um, the, uh, the negative plate and the print. The, uh, even in the developing, temperatures have to be right these negatives can't be put in stop bath after developed. They put in cool water and then fixed. <clears throat> There's no acid involved or the image will slide off. I got to experience uh, maybe not quite the way Carlton Watkins or Edward Sheriff Curtis uh, experienced but I, I, I got to experience a small portion of what it was like to tote hundreds of glass plates, chemistry, dark room, by horse and wagon to remote places across the United States. Um, Carlton Watkins shooting uh, Yosemite and uh, Edward Sheriff Curtis shooting from Mexico to Alaska, Native Americans. I got to experience just a small part of that and uh, every bit of it was worth it.